I'll wait till on the dot of 10.30. be on the dot but um good morning everybody this is the third preliminary hearing into module three uh, an investigation of the impact on the healthcare systems during the pandemic and we have a huge amount to get through so i shall say no more and ask miss jacqueline carey king's council who is lead counsel for the inquiry uh, for this module uh, as well as for the care module uh, to outline the issues that i have to consider today miss carey thank you my lady as you've just um, made clear, this is the third preliminary hearing in Module 3. And of the 36 core participants in this module, 20, I think, are present in the room today at Dorland House, and a number of other, others are attending online. I know that in advance of today's hearing, you've received written submissions from a number of core participants, many of whom I know wish to expand upon but not repeat those submissions orally today. It's not practical or necessary for me to respond to all of the matters raised, but as we go through the agenda, there are various aspects that I will seek to address from Council to the Inquiry's perspective. And I think the agenda has been put up on the screens at Dorland House. There are updates in relation to Rule 9's expert witnesses, disclosure, every story matters, and the timetable for the public hearings in due course. So may I turn, please, to an update in relation to Rule 9 requests. As at the start of this month, Module 3 has sent over 190 Rule 9 requests to individuals, organisations and government bodies across the UK. And we have received back 91 signed statements, of which 69 have been disclosed. The Module 3 Solicitor Team Monthly Update Note provides details of the recipients of those requests and indeed an overview of the topics which they have been asked about. Recent Rule 9 requests have been sent to the respective Health Ministers and Cabinet Secretaries during the relevant period, namely Matt Hancock and Sajid Javid, Robin Swan, Jean Freeman, Humza Youssef, Vaughan Gething and Eluned Morgan. And for the avoidance of confusion, it may be helpful for me to clarify that, contrary to the submissions of some of the core participants, these were not late requests, but were as a result of a deliberate decision by the inquiry legal team to await the receipt of the bulk of the corporate statements, some of which have been delayed, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and for some of the witnesses to have been given evidence in modules 2, 2A and 2B. As you might imagine, my lady, the Module 3 team has been keen to ensure that all relevant information and evidence was taken into account when drafting focused Rule 9 requests for those individuals, and accordingly in our submission it would have been premature and inefficient for those Rule 9s to have been issued sooner. Uh, the deadlines for those Rule 9 statements are mid to late May of this year, so four months before the start of the hearing. And if there are any requests for extensions from uh, those individuals, then those applications will be scrutinised to ensure that timely onward disclosure to the core participants is not hampered. Over the course of the Rule 9 process, the inquiry has provided recipients of Rule 9 requests with a deadline by which the draft statement should be submitted. Now, some recipients have um, asked the inquiry for an extension by which to file their response, and in appropriate cases, reasonable extensions have been granted. However, since the last preliminary hearing, your ladyship has considered it necessary to issue what are called Section 21 Inquiries Act notices to a number of government department and agencies to ensure that all matters raised in the Rule 9 requests are properly addressed and that the evidence is provided in time to allow the inquiry legal team to progress its work. By way of background, the department and agencies in question received their Rule 9 requests in the spring of 2023. They were issued between March and May of last year. And applications for extensions for deadlines were often granted. However, the inquiry became increasingly concerned to hear that some delays in receiving evidence were said to have been a result of the work required on other modules, whether preparing statements or preparing for public hearings. 
even in circumstances when many months had elapsed between the Rule 9 request being issued by Module 3 and the draft statement or parts thereof being received. In deciding to issue Section 21 notices, you were cognizant not only of the demands placed on those departments by other inquiry modules and indeed by other public inquiries, but also of the everyday pressures of the respective departments' normal work, particularly over the winter. And I know that you took this into account when setting and where necessary varying Section 21 deadlines. Those Section 21 notices have been issued to four government bodies and departments, UK HSA, Department of Health and Social Care, the Welsh Government Health and Social Services Group and the Department of Health Northern Ireland. All deadlines have been met. In some instances, the statements provided did not adequately address all matters set out in the Rule 9 request or indeed in the Section 21 notice. And that has been the case with a question to the Welsh Chief Medical Officer, some questions in one part of the Department of Health's response, some questions in the revised draft corporate statement by the Welsh Government, and some questions in the Department of Health Northern Ireland corporate statement. And so consequently, further Rule 9 requests and or varied Section 21 notices have been issued with a short deadline for a response to ensure that all topics are fully answered. In addition to the Rule 9 requests sent by the module, three team, the inquiry is grateful for the suggestions made by core participants as to which in, uh, additional individuals or bodies should receive a Rule 9 request and or be sent a supplemental Rule 9 request. These suggestions are actively being considered in particular to ensure that any further requests are proportionate and sufficiently focused on assisting the inquiry with any future recommendations your Ladyship may make. Where the module already has a body of evidence covering a particular topic or the request does not fall within a key area that is within scope, it is unlikely the inquiry will consider it necessary to issue a Rule 9 request or a supplemental Rule 9. Now, my lady, within the Rule 9 request, there are a number of discrete topics to which I'd like to return. The first is what is known as the spotlight hospitals. As you may appreciate, one of the challenges for a module of this size is to obtain evidence about the impact of national decision making upon those operating within the healthcare system, including how hospitals responded, if I may put it like this, on the ground to the COVID pandemic. And so in this regard, in December of last year, Module 3 sent Rule 9 requests to 22 hospitals across the length and breadth of the UK. The requests focused on examples of the steps taken to respond, how the hospitals responded to the challenges faced, and we sought practical examples of their response. The focus of the request was therefore very much from the perspectives of the people working in the hospitals, rather than from the perspectives of the patients or their families. Now, my lady, whether the use of the phrase spotlight hospitals is the correct terminology to describe the evidence gathering exercise perhaps might be debatable. But the aim of this work is to gather evidence from the hospitals themselves as to how the pandemic affected them and the staff working in them. And while a number of core participants have welcomed the inquiry's approach to the spotlight evidence, others have expressed concerns about the number of hospitals involved or the methodology behind the selection of the hospitals. And so it might assist this morning if I set out a little more detail about those matters. The purpose of the spotlights is not to identify hospitals most severely affected by the pandemic, nor is it to conduct an examination nation by nation, region by region, or hospital by hospital. It is not a comparative exercise comparing one hospital's response against another, nor could it be. As was made clear in the update note sent out in January, but covering the December work, and in accordance with the inquiry's terms of reference, it is not the inquiry's intention to examine or compare the circumstances surrounding the treatment of individual patients or the outcomes of their treatment. The intention of requesting the information from the spotlight hospitals is to assist my lady in identifying recurring themes and particular issues that arose with respect to the healthcare system's response. The themes that will emerge 
inevitably will not be considered as an exhaustive list, nor necessarily representative of the experiences in each and every hospital across the UK. But as the evidence will, uh, comes in, it will come to form part of the inquiry's broader investigation into the operational and healthcare pressures or challenges faced by the healthcare systems across the UK during the relevant period. The number and location of the spotlight hospitals were chosen so as to gain evidence from across the four nations, taking into account matters including the respective populations within each nation, covering some rural and urban areas. And accordingly, two spotlight hospitals were selected from each of Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, with the remaining 16 spotlights being selected from England. The number of spotlights is inevitably limited, given that this exercise is but one aspect of Module 3's work and the need to be proportionate, not just within Module 3, but across the inquiry's work as a whole. And in our submission, this would be consistent with your Ladyship's obligations under Section 17 of the Inquiries Act to act with fairness and with regard to the need to avoid unnecessary cost, whether to the public or to the witnesses. The inquiry has been asked to send Spotlight Rule 9 requests to a hospital in each of the seven healthcare boards in Wales and the five health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland. I note that were the inquiry to adopt that approach across the entire UK, it result in spotlight requests being sent to hospitals in each of the 14 territorial NHS boards in Scotland and potentially to nearly 230 NH trusts in England. So a total of 250 hospitals across the UK. In our submission, a course of action that would be disproportionate and contrary to your commitment to run this inquiry efficiently. My lady, as you will have appreciated from the written submissions, the COVID-19 bereaved families for Justice Cymru raised specific concerns amongst their members about nosocomial infection rates or hospital-acquired infection in Wales. They submit that in the absence of a separate Welsh COVID-19 public inquiry, Module 3 should spotlight a hospital in each of the seven boards in order to obtain an accurate and or reflective picture of what happened in Welsh hospitals. My lady, in my submission, this request misunderstands the aim behind this part of the inquiry's work, which is to provide a UK-wide perspective on recurring themes regarding the healthcare systems. And importantly, it is not to investigate particular issues in Wales. The request that this inquiry reflect sufficiently and broadly the dominant and distinct issues which arose in Wales risks in our submission falling into the kind of comparative exercise that is not appropriate. In relation to hospital acquired infection rates in Wales, Module 3 has already obtained a large amount of evidence on this issue, including in the statements and exhibits provided by the Welsh CMO, Frank Atherton, Public Health Wales, and the Welsh Government Health and Social Services Group. Now, my lady, one of those statements was disclosed in a chance of disclosure made yesterday. Um, two of the statements are due for disclosure in the coming tranches to be made, but those statements taken as a whole helped to establish how hospital-acquired transmission was identified, understood, and addressed in Wales throughout the relevant period. Now, and I, clearly I appreciate, given that much of this disclosure is to come, that it's understandable that the core participants are yet unaware of the evidence that is available and the totality of that evidence. But in addition, the infection prevention and control experts are being asked to summarise and critically analyse official es estimates of hospital-acquired infection in all four nations, as well as the alternative estimates si uh, published in the scientific literature. When selecting the spotlight hospitals, the inquiry considered a number of different factors, including the questionnaire responses provided by some trusts, health boards, and health and social care trusts, and identifying from those responses hospitals which may be able to provide practical information and evidence to the inquiry. Module three also selected some hospitals where the trust or board did not provide a response to the inquiry's questionnaire. And we also sought out publicly available information about particular issues arising in hospitals. 
and the Rule 9 requests were sent to the medical or clinical director or chief medical officer or equivalent at each of the 22 hospitals across the UK. The request specifically asked that the statement be provided by an appropriate individual or individuals who are able to provide evidence about events during the relevant period rather than a corporate statement from the senior management team at the trust or the board responsible for that hospital. The requests themselves sent to each hospital covered the same topic areas and questions. In addition, the inquiry asked some hospitals about specific issues that were raised either in the questionnaire responses or were revealed in open source research on the hospital in question, where those issues might have indicated systemic problems in the response to COVID-19. All 22 uh, hospitals have now responded. The draft statements have had feedback provided on them, and they are now in the process of being finalised, uh, ready for disclosure. Initial analysis of the statements suggests that some common themes are emerging. And related, this is just a small snapshot of some of the evidence, but there are themes emerging such as staff shortages prior to the pandemic and or shortages work to workers isolating and becoming ill during the pandemic. A number have raised relaxation in nursing fixed ratios of care. Other responses reveal the numbers of workers suffering from long COVID and the varying methods of support offered by hospitals for staff with long COVID. Issues raised include practical problems with the physical condition of the estate, particularly in older hospital buildings, which presented challenges implementing IPC guidance, for example, nar narrow corridors or poor ventilation. There is evidence in those statements about variations in approaches to visiting restrictions. Also evidence, particularly from the English spotlights, about the impact of vaccination as a condition of deployment, or VCOD, as it's known, not just in terms of ascertaining numbers of workers who were or weren't vaccinated, but also often uh, the damaging effect of the proposal on staff relations and morale. And a number of the spotlights speak of the impact on workers from ethnic minority backgrounds. There were some innovative practices adopted by some of the hospitals. May I just give you one or two examples? There are booking systems for visitors, family liaison officers to aid virtual communications. There were virtual follow-up of antenatal, postnatal COVID positive women. There were examples of the lengths to which some of those working in hospitals went to provide care. Just one example, in Outna Gelvin in Northern Ireland, workers placed little wooden hearts in the pockets of patients who were approaching death as a small connection to their loved ones that could not be with them in hospital. There are some painful accounts of the impact uh, on staff working in hospital. For example, in Manchester Royal Infirmary, one of the elderly wards in wave two experienced seven patient deaths within 24 hours, whereas outside of the pandemic, it was death every one to two weeks. As I say, they are but just some examples of the evidence obtained by the spotlight hospitals. The hospitals were not asked about any plans they had in place for dealing with the pandemic, this evidence being more appropriately obtained from the respective departments of health. But that said, a number of the spotlights provided evidence of the plans they put in place as the pandemic took hold. And in our submission, the totality of this evidence combined with the Rule 9s uh, sent to the government departments means it's not necessary to instruct an expert to consider the question of preparedness separately to the consideration of preparedness in the existing reports that the inquiry already has. My lady, some core participants have expressed a concern that the signatory to the spotlight statement might provide a, a rose-tinted view, or that the statement has been written from an unduly corporate perspective. In fact, having reviewed a number of the draft statements myself, overall, we do not consider this concern and has materialised. And in fact, there is now a body of evidence attesting to how the pandemic affected the hospitals and their staff, including those working on the front line. My lady, three of the core participants have submitted that the spotlight should be extended 
to include other services, for example, primary care, pharmacies and ambulances. Module 3 has considered this suggestion carefully, but considers that the evidence received from the relevant Royal Colleges, ambulance trusts and other associations and bodies properly and proportionately examines issues affecting these parts of the healthcare system. May I turn to a, a different aspect of um, the Rule 9 uh, work uh, that is going on uh, and deal with some research that has recently been commissioned. Because in addition to the spotlights, the inquiry has commissioned a research survey on escalation of care decisions made by frontline healthcare workers. And the primary issue being considered is how frontline clinicians made decisions about escalation of care during the extreme circumstances of the pandemic and whether thresholds for escalating a patient's care were altered based on resource availability rather than clinical need. That includes decisions about the assessment of patients in the community and escalating them to hospital and then once in hospital escalation to critical care. The project aims to hear from a wide range of healthcare professionals involved in decisions about escalation of care including paramedics, 111 call handlers, clinical advisors, GPs, A&E doctors, and doctors based on general wards, and doctors and nurses based on critical wards. The inquiry has commissioned IFF Research to conduct this project. IFF Research is a company with significant experience and technical expertise in running large-scale surveys of healthcare professionals and further information on the project will be provided in the monthly update notes in due course. The final matter I wish to raise in relation to the Rule 9 update is in relation to impact evidence. Module 3's scope makes clear that it will examine the impact of the pandemic on people's experiences of healthcare during the pandemic, including through illustrative accounts. And so, in addition, therefore, to the accounts given by those individuals who have contributed to the inquiry's listening exercise, Every Story Matters, Module 3 has invited 21 of the core participant groups in Module 3 from across the UK to provide short summary accounts from a specified number of individual members of those groups or individuals supported by those groups during the relevant period about their experience of the healthcare system. The core participants in groups include all of the bereaved family groups, charities, other groups such as the clinically vulnerable, those with long COVID, professional membership organisations, and it's hoped that in this way, a range of experiences of healthcare during the pandemic will be captured the summaries are designed to help the inquiry identify those witnesses who may be able to speak to, su to systemic issues, including, for example, individuals working on the front line, such as healthcare workers, cleaners, porters, ambulance staff, paramedics, pharmacists, doctors and nurses. And they'll be able to speak to concerns about, for example, PPE and about the sheer physical, mental and emo emotional toll that the pandemic took. A small number of these witnesses will be formally asked to provide statements and some of those will be asked to give oral evidence at the public hearing. That will be in addition to other evidence about the impact of the pandemic on individuals as set out in some of the other statements the inquiry has received as well as in Every Story Matters. My Lady, the inquiry legal team has started to review the summaries with a view to identifying those individuals who may receive a Rule 9 request where a witness is not called to give evidence, we anticipate inviting you to reduce that written statement into evidence through publishing it on the inquiry website. It follows from what I have said that in addition to Every Story Matters, some impact evidence will be called at the public hearing and some statements are likely to be published. But I know that a number of the core participants urge the inquiry to hear from a larger selection of impact witnesses in our submission, it's not about calling any set or specific number of witnesses, but rather about ensuring you hear from a range of individuals who are best placed to convey the impact of the pandemic based on their respective experiences. 
my lady. That's all I wish to say about um, the Rule 9 update. And may I just uh, deviate slightly from the agenda and actually deal with expert witnesses now before going on to disclosure, which might in fact make more sense uh, in relation to a number of the submissions that you are to receive this morning. The inquiry has identified eight areas for expert evidence, and seven of the reports are progressing well and are on track. I know that some core participants have repeated their request to have sight of the letters of instruction. This remains an unnecessary step in our submission. Sight of the draft report and the option to comment on the draft report provides ample opportunity for core participants to contribute to the final expert report. And I can confirm that the expert reports are all addressing matters affecting the UK and not just looking at the position in the country in which the expert is based. Uh, the first of those reports is a report in relation to long COVID and the uh, report of Professor Chris Breitling and Dr Rachel Evidence was disclosed yesterday in the tranche of disclosure made. They also, I think you'll recall, prepared a report for module two and that has been disclosed to the Module 3 core participants. Whilst addressing you on the topic of Long Covid, some core participants repeat their request for Module 3 to look at whether Long Covid should be designated as a disability or an occupational disease, and for you to look at the financial support for those diagnosed with Long Covid. My Lady, I know, will not be assisted by repetition, and you've already ruled that this is not a matter falling within the scope of Module 3. So unless any new information is brought to your attention in the course of this preliminary hearing, I would invite you to confirm your earlier ruling. The second report uh, that has been commissioned is in relation to intensive care. The draft report by Dr Ganesh Thalaringam and Professor Charlotte Summers has been sent to core participants, and I know they will be working on that, and their comments are due by the 16th of April. Four non-COVID uh, conditions are being looked at within the scope of Module 3. Ischemic heart disease, colorectal cancer, hip replacements and inpatient children and young people's mental health services. There are expert reports on all four conditions that have been commissioned. All four reports will examine a healthcare, from a healthcare systems perspective the impact of the pandemic on diagnosis, care and treatment of the respective non-coded conditions. And the reports are looking at how diagnostic and treatment pathways were maintained during the pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, and the outcome of delays to diagnosis and or care and treatment on patient outcomes. And so taking each in turn, would you, my lady, excuse me. I just have some water. Um, in relation to ischemic heart disease, Professor Christopher Gale, who is a professor of cardiovascular medicine at the University of Leeds, and his colleague, Dr. Ramesh Nadaraja, who's a cardiology specialty registrar, have prepared a draft report, and that was sh shared with core participants earlier this week. The reports in relation to elective hip replacement surgery and on inpatient children and young people's mental health services, the drafts are due to be received by the inquiry in May. And in relation to colorectal cancer, Professor Anil Bangu and his colleague, Dr. Dmitry Napodgiev, who are based in uh, the University of Birmingham, have been instructed in relation to colorectal cancer, and their draft report is likely to be sent to core participants for their comments in May. There is an expert report commissioned in relation to primary care and emergency pre-hospital care. Professor Helen Snooks, who is a professor of health services research at Swansea University, and Professor Adrian Edwards, who is a profession, professor forgive me, of general practice at Cardiff University, have been instructed to provide a draft report examining a number of aspects of healthcare outside of hospitals. And their report will comment on uh, changes to primary care, the way in which it was accessed, including the transition to remote primary care, such as the use of either telephone triage or video calls, oximetry at home, other remote monitoring. They are going to look at emergency pre-hospital care, including changes to 999 and 111 calls, and impact on ambulance services 
including response time by category, handover time, outcome, whether related to likely COVID-19 or not. They are going to look at the escalation from community care to hospital care. And they are also going to look at the shielding programme, including how the shielding criteria evolved over time, a summary of relevant published academic research on some of the positive and negative impacts of the shielding programme, and an evaluation of any known qualitative or quantitative differences between England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland in the outcomes of the shielding programme, if that is available. It is not the inquiry's present intention to ask the experts to provide their opinion on the impact of COVID-19 on children's experiences of the healthcare system, including clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable children. Now, that draft report is likely to be sent to core participants in May. I know that John's campaign core participant group submits that this report should cover healthcare provision in people's homes, care settings, mental health units, and other community settings. My lady, as you are aware, access to healthcare in some care settings is a matter being examined in Module 6. Moreover, as you already made clear in your ruling following the second preliminary hearing in this module, the other settings are not referred to within the scope of Module 3. And in the November monthly update note, you confirm that the impact on mental health services would not be examined in Module 3. In light of those matters, the inquiry does not intend to expand the areas that this expert will, report will cover. May I make it clear, however, that the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of healthcare workers is a matter about which evidence has been and is being gathered. And I hope that that allays any misunderstanding on the part of some core participants that this module is not looking at the harm caused to the mental health of those working in the healthcare sector. <clears throat> and um, finally, uh, the final report that is being commissioned by the inquiry is that in relation to infection prevention and control, or IPC. My lady, in my note to the core participants last month, I explained that progress in relation to the expert report on IPC is not as Module 3 anticipated or would have wished. In short, of the original five experts identified in September 2023, only two are now available to continue with this work. Those two are Clive Beggs and Hayo Grunman. Clive Beggs' draft report will shortly be ready to be disclosed to core participants. That report focuses on the mechanism of transmission of COVID-19, the role of ventilation and air cleaning systems in hospitals, and the role of respiratory protective equipment, or RPE, in mitigating the transmission of COVID-19. Although the inquiry had initially envisaged producing an overarching IPC report to which all IPC experts contributed, rather than delay the provision of feedback on this report, the inquiry intends to ask all participants to comment on Professor Begg's re draft report so that this aspect of IPC expert evidence can be progressed. In relation to the other aspects of IPC, and in particular to changing clinical guidelines, testing and other IPC interventions and experiences on the front line, the inquiry has devoted considerable time to identify suitable replacements. Dr. Ji Yen Shin, a consultant virologist and director of IPC at University College London Hospital's NHS Trust. Professor Dina Gold, an independent IPC consultant and an honorary professor of nursing at the City of University, sorry, City University London. And Dr. Ben Warren, an academic clinical lecturer and specialty registrar in infectious disease and general internal medicine, have all now confirmed that they are willing and able to write a report covering the remaining IPC issues within scope. And so I anticipate and very much hope that the IPC expert report is now very much back on track. A number of core participants invite you to consider other areas for expert evidence. The COVID bereaved Families for Justice UK and the Northern Irish COVID bereaved Families for Justice submit that Module 3 needs to obtain further evidence about the disproportionate outcomes on black and minority ethnic healthcare workers and discrimination, whether that's on the, age, uh, on the basis of age, sex, gender, disability, 
and on people suffering different types of mental health conditions. They suggest that the experts in previous modules who consider these matters should produce, where necessary, Module 3 specific addenda. In our submission, this is not necessary. Those reports provide you with the necessary context and background to a number of different disproportionate impacts. And those reports will therefore complement the statements and evidence obtained by Module 3, which examine disproportionate impacts, including, to name just one statement, in the statement from the NHS Race and Health Observatory. The John's Campaign core participant group asked that Module 3 obtains expert evidence on the use, and it is said misuse, of DNA CPR notices. My Lady, a large number of the Rule 9 requests sent by Module 3 have asked about the use of DNA CPR notices, and so we do not consider it necessary to instruct an expert on this topic. I think, as I may have said at an earlier preliminary hearing, it would not be possible to instruct experts on every area within the scope of Module 3, or indeed on every impact felt and suffered. And so the Johns Campaign Group also requests that Module 3 obtain expert evidence on how those with learning disabilities accessed healthcare services and the impact on the learning disabled and those with cognitive impairments. And my lady, that is in our submission one of those areas where the module simply cannot exceed to every request, no matter how important the topic is for those people who suffer with those disabilities. Three of the core participants uh, have submitted that an expert should be appointed to comment on the use of private sector contracting and outsourcing during the pandemic. Module 3 has requested and or already received evidence relating to the use of private hospitals during the pandemic, and I emphasise the phrase use of private hospitals, as that is the phrase that appears within Module 3's scope. Accordingly, the inquiry legal team does not consider that the expert evidence is required on this topic. And my lady, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society submit that an expert should be appointed who has expertise in pharmacists and pharmacy to consider matters including the impact of IPC guidance on pharmacy teams and the adequacy of provision of PPE to pharmacists. Module 3 has sought evidence on these and other topics from a number of witnesses and so it does not consider that an expert in addition to that evidence is necessary. Uh, turning to, my lady, the next matter on the agenda, and that is disclosure. In addition to the 12 tranches of disclosure already made by Module 3, there are over 80 draft statements that are either being reviewed and feedback prepared, or where the inquiry has given feedback and requested that the statements be finalised. <coughs> Recent tranches of disclosure in March and April this year contain a significant proportion of corporate witness evidence from organisations and departments such as NHS England, DHSC, the Office for the Chief Medical Officer, UKHSA, the Health and Safety Executive, Public Health Scotland and NHS Services Scotland. Those statements are lengthy and detailed and cover a wide range of topics relevant to Module 3's scope. And in addition, there have been and there will be disclosure of statements of some of Module 3's core participant groups, which highlight specific areas of concerns relevant to their members. It's inevitable that reading and assimilating all that material will take some time, and therefore the inquiry legal team considers that in order to have a more meaningful and detailed second draft of the list of issues, the second draft of the list of issues should be circulated once the disclosed material has been analysed. The inquiry currently holds 14,000 documents, totalling around 157,000 pages, which will be disclosed on Module 3 in due course. I see my lady's eyes raise. I was just thinking, not much for me to do then. Um, that doesn't include the statements and associated exhibits which are not yet signed or provided to the inquiry. Now, I provide those figures so that core participants know the scale of disclosure that will be forthcoming and I hope that it will assist them in their resourcing arrangements for reviewing those documents. It's, it's not meant to scare, but to try and assist with what is coming uh, in the next few months. A number of core participants 
have requested that disclosure or the majority thereof is completed by the end of June of this year. Now, the inquiry is working hard to review and disclose material on Module 3, but it must be acknowledged that much of the disclosure work is still going on Module 2C, which I think starts at the end of this month and goes into May. And so consequently, some of the inquiry's resources are diverted to that module and indeed to later modules, which have public hearings in 2025. The inquiry's resources, like those of material providers, are not unlimited and difficult decisions must be made. But may I make it plain, Module 3 is equally keen to complete the better part of disclosure by the end of June or early July. And that ambition may be all the more achievable as the inquiry is currently prioritising the disclosure of the statements and exhibits provided to Module 3 directly, as this is of particular relevance. The inquiry recognises the quantities of material being disclosed each week must increase significantly from the current rate. Um, and so we will be increasing the amount of paralegal resource available to Module 3 and anticipate that that will double the current rate at which disclosure is being made. There are also a number of ways in which core participants and material providers can assist the inquiry to speed up the rate of uh, current disclosure. A number of material providers are seeking significant extensions of time in which to review provisional redactions to material beyond the standard three working days, including extensions of up to two weeks. Going forward, Module 3 is unlikely to be able to grant any significant extensions. As I have said, we need to double the quantities of material being disclosed each week, and material providers may wish to bear this in mind when deciding who will review the material for redactions and how to seek instructions from clients who may be on leave. Some core participant material providers are still engaging in protracted and evolving correspondence about the redaction of senior officials' names. To give one example, UKHSA has recently changed the list of individuals it considers to be senior officials, which is causing ongoing redaction issues. It's also asked Module 3 to redact the names of people from other government departments, such as Clara Swinson, who's a Director General at DHSE, Graham Medley, a member of SAGE, and Ruth May, who is the Chief Nerfing Officer in England. The inquiry's established position is that it will only redact the names and email addresses of those of whom it considers to be junior officials. And in our submission, those three individuals, for example, are clearly not junior. Engaging in correspondence about these matters at the material provider review stage, of course, takes time for the inquiry's legal team to respond to and resolve, all of which diverts resources from the actual review, redaction and disclosure task. Material providers are therefore urged to assist the inquiry in this important task where they can and respond as swiftly as possible to queries and not repeatedly raise the same issue where the inquiry has made its position clear, not change the names they ask to redact and not to seek redactions on publicly available material. And so taking that as a whole with a renewed ambition from the inquiry's perspective and the cooperation I know from the core participant material providers and other material providers, it is hoped that we will be in a position to complete the bulk of that disclosure by the end of June or early July. In addition, Module 3 has reviewed the transcripts of evidence from Modules 1 and 2, and the relevant transcripts and statements will be disclosed in a separate discrete tranche of disclosure. Work is ongoing reviewing the transcripts of evidence from Modules 2A and B. That has commenced, and 2C module will be reviewed in due course. My lady, the penultimate matter on the agenda is Every Story Matters. Over 11,000 experiences of healthcare services during the pandemic have been shared with Every Story Matters via the online web form, with many more sharing their experiences of having had COVID-19, bereavement and long COVID. The inquiry has heard from people around the UK directly as part of Every Story Matters events programmes, including members of the public, bereaved families, long COVID survivors and healthcare staff. And in addition, 450 individuals have participated in the research interviews for Every Story Matters, including 212 patients and 238 healthcare workers and other professionals in the healthcare, in healthcare roles. All those experiences are being analysed and we brought together in the first Every Story Matters report for the inquiry, 
and that report is due to be provided to the inquiry in the middle of this month, following which it will be reviewed by the inquiry legal team, feedback provided, it will be finalised and formatted. Those matters take a little time, and we anticipate that the report will be shared with the core participants by the end of June. And finally, my lady, the public hearings. Module 3 public hearings will commence on the 9th of September this year and take place in two phases, each lasting five weeks. The inquiry is not planning to hold hearings in the week of the 14th and 21st of October, and so the second phase will begin on the 28th of October. Uh, requests have been made to move the two-week break, but I understand that this cannot be accommodated. The inquiry does not currently anticipate holding a further preliminary hearing for Module 3 before the start of the public hearings in September. However, I know that the inquiry will keep this under review and will inform all core participants if it considers a further preliminary hearing to be necessary. A number of the core participants submit that a 10-week hearing time is insufficient to examine the matters within Module 3 and have asked that additional hearing time be allocated. My Lady, you've already allocated 10 weeks of hearing time to Module 3, making this the longest public hearing to date. But even so, you may think that it is simply not possible to include more than is already envisaged. Moreover, you have been clear that inquiry will not run on and on and that you want to hear evidence and make recommendations in a timely manner. Given the inquiry's programme of work, including, for example, preparation for hearings in 2025 and the publication of reports, it will not be possible to extend the hearing time, nor will it be possible to move the two-week break. The inquiry legal team notes that a number of written submissions have repeated core participants' offers to assist the inquiry in its work, and we will hope this will be extended to being focused on those matters that require examination and exploration in the public hearing, knowing that your ladyship will have considered in full the written statements and evidence contained therein. And so in preparation for the public hearings, as I've already uh, alluded to, the second draft of the list of issues we hope to um, circulate by the end of May, along with a provisional list of it witnesses, and we will invite the core participant submissions on those documents in due course. The monthly update notes will provide detail about the process for evidence proposals to be sent to core participants and the precise pre-Rule 10 procedure to be adopted by Module 3. But at the outset, I must observe, with 36 separate core participant groups and organisations, suggestions for pre-Rule 10 questions need to be proportionate and focused. Not every question or point can be raised or needs to be put to every witness and core participants are asked to reflect carefully on this before making any pre-Rule 10 applications in Module 3. Module 3 will adopt the process used in earlier modules and accordingly ask that pre-Rule 10 requests are limited to key and significant matters, and to matters that the core participants does not anticipate CTI will cover. It assists no one, and it's not conducive to an efficient process for the inquiry legal teams, nor indeed for the core participant legal teams, for pre-Rule 10 applications to be made in respect of questions that counsel to the inquiry are obviously going to ask. Moreover, the inquiry legal team considers that the contents of any pre-Rule 10 applications may be better focused on questions and areas that might lead you to making meaningful recommendations for the future. My lady, I, I make those observations knowing that all core participants have repeatedly assured your ladyship of their desire and willingness to assist the inquiry in its work. And we hope that that renewed focus will help the public hearings run smoothly and efficiently and ensure that core participants' particular interests in a witness or a topic are advanced either by counsel to the inquiry's questions or by the core participants' questions themselves. Further guidance on the evidence proposals and the pre-Rule 10 process will be provided in the monthly update notes in due course. My Lady, that's all I propose to say by uh, way of counsel to the inquiry submissions to your ladyship. Can I invite you please to publish the written submissions on the website later today? And I think the four, first core participant to address you is Mr. Weatherby King's counsel. Thank you. Submissions will be published. Thank you very much, my lady. Mr. Weatherby. 
Good morning, my lady. Uh, as you know, I um, appear for uh, COVID Bereaved Families for Justice at UK. Um, as we hope we've done consistently so far, um, our submissions today are made in the spirit of assisting the inquiry uh, in fulfilling its um, uh, terms of reference. Um, can I say at the outset that we've looked carefully at the written submissions of other, uh, particularly the non-state core participants, and we support many, uh, perhaps most of the points so clearly made by them, and I'll try not to over overlap too much um, uh, 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 treading on their, their lawns. Um, but in particular, we support the submissions of MIND, um, urging the inquiry to include adult mental health within Module 3. Um, our submissions, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about in due course, resonate um, with FEMHO and others regarding the need for um, further discrimination evidence. Um, and we specifically endorse submissions made uh, about the issue of the downgrading of COVID as an HCID. I consequence infectious disease in March 2020, uh, made by, I think, the BMA and the Airborne Transmission Alliance. Uh, and no doubt you'll recall this is an issue that we raised um, in questioning of Professor Van Tam in Module 2. So um, turning swiftly to the issues on the agenda, um, Rule 9's and evidence gathering, um, we're grateful for the updates. Um, we've raised a number of issues. Um, I'll raise th them orally in two um, short sections, if I may. Firstly, evidence gathering generally, and secondly, uh, uh, spotlight. Um, on the general level, we note the inquiry um, has had to resort, as Ms Kerry has set out this morning, to Section 21 notices, um, because uh, um, document pr producers hadn't responded um, or hadn't responded sufficiently to requests made as long ago as last spring. Uh, and although that has achieved progress, as one would expect, um, much does remain uh, from the updates outstanding. Uh, we're not unsympathetic to the amount of work that goes into providing disclosure. Um, uh, we're not uh, unsympathetic to the fact that many of the evidence providers are um, also um, engaged in providing services. However, um, the work that needs to be done doesn't get less if it's not attended to expeditiously. Uh, Non-compliance makes things worse for the evidence providers themselves. Um, and delay just causes problems elsewhere in the process. Uh, and the answer, the simple answer, is that document providers must do as the inquiry requests within the time scales set. And we respectfully urge you to um, uh, use Section 20 more, perhaps more liberally, in terms of ensuring that happens. Additional resources have to be allocated um, if necessary. And if they're not, uh, the consequent delays will result in at least three effects in our submission. One, uh, the wasting of substantial amounts of public money. Uh, two, uh, further uh, untold stress to families, witnesses, all directly involved. Um, and three, uh, impeding the reaching of your conclusions and recommendations which are so vital. Um, I'm sorry if all that sounds so obvious, but it needed saying in, in my submission. Um, moving on to spotlight hospitals, we note um, the explanation of how uh, example facilities have been selected. We raised no objection in principle uh, to this sort of approach, but we have raised a number of points uh, in the written submissions from paragraph six onwards. Um, we would have raised these earlier had there been consultation about the spotlights, and we might have been in a position to have assisted the inquiry earlier and better had that happened. Um, the points we raise are in four um, categories. One, the selection itself. Two, uh, the evidence gathering from the chosen uh, facilities. Uh, three, whether uh, the approach should be adopted for other healthcare facilities. And four, the issue of preparedness. In in respect of selection, um, we note what has been carefully set out in terms of the uh, selection of hospitals across the four nations and jurisdictions um, and across population spread. Uh, we understand the approach, that it's designed to get a spread of evidence from a, a, across the UK, uh, and we understand the questionnaire uh, approach that was adopted to it, although we haven't had disclosure of those questionnaires as of yet. Uh, no method of selection is going to be perfect, um, but as we've set out in our written submissions, um, there are um, key issues that um, we would um, urge further consideration on. 
Um, for example, and only by way of example, um, at paragraph seven, um, we've noted the choice of hospitals in Northern Ireland includes the main cities, but not the rural areas. We'll leave that to the Northern Ireland team to de develop. Uh, and we've noted that both of the hospitals selected in Wales are in South Wales, which rather uh, excludes the healthcare experience from uh, across the rest of the country uh, and the other health boards there, many of which are very different from the South Wales metropolises. Uh, and we note the Cymru team's written submissions on, on that too, and we won't trespass on those. Um, again, a, a minded to approach might have allowed us to have assisted on that issue um, earlier. Um, Similarly, we, we've raised the point about whether the demographics of the areas of the hospitals were considered, as well as um, the, the more straightforward issue of population spread. Um, in our submission, the different racial and ethnic minority uh, communities served by hospitals is of great importance uh, and should have been uh, part of the selection criteria. Um, we hope uh, that the inquiry will seek evidence from healthcare workers and bereaved families with experience from the, the spotlight hospitals, um, and also from further afield than the spotlight hospitals um, as well. Uh, and as you've heard, we've um, submitted a schedule of summaries which we hope will help in, in that selection. Now, I'll deal with that in a moment, freestanding uh, as a topic, if I may. But just on this section of, of the spotlight hospitals, I note that one of the accounts, by way of example, that we put forward is a bereaved family member uh, who was also a frontline doctor um, during the pa pandemic and who, in fact, worked in a hospital in North Wales. So the selection of, of individuals such as that might help in, <coughs> in dealing with some of the perceived um, deficiencies in, in the approach. Um, secondly, with respect to Spotlight Hospital's evidence gathering, um, we note the, what's been said about um, uh, seeking evidence from chief medical officers. Um, we um, recognise and absolutely agree with the intention to go beyond a corporate view, but we do maintain our concerns um, that this um, doesn't, isn't likely to achieve that because CMOs are, are themselves uh, members of health trusts and boards, uh, and they may have their own um, motivations to present um, what we've suggested might be a rose-tinted view. And so we urge the inquiry to take a much wider um, view and seek evidence from um, patient groups, patient advice and liaison services, where that applies, trade unions and professional bodies, for example. Um, at paragraph 11, we've um, indicated our concerns that um, the uh, timetable is ambitious to consider such a wide set of issues uh, and evidence across four healthcare systems. Um, we repeat an earlier submission that to make the spotlight approach work, that it may be of assistance to commission a panel of experts to assist in analysing and honing the evidence um, so that uh, only that which is uh, important to the inquiry uh, need be called or can be collated by um, people with expertise in, in that kind of um, uh, uh, area. Um, we, again, indicate that we would be very much uh, um, open. We would encourage a collaborative approach to this uh, with your team. Uh, calling evidence over 22 hospitals in such a short period of weeks is going to be challenging, and there need to be innovative ways presented of, of dealing with that. Um, we have raised, um, maybe too persistently, the issue of position statements. Uh, I'm not going to raise that issue again generally, uh, but with respect to spotlight hospitals, this is an area uh, where uh, seeking a uh, corporate summary uh, of what happened at particular institutions and trusts, of what went right and wrong through their own lens, uh, may well be a, 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 an effective way of again honing the ambit of the evidence. Position statements um, uh, 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 allow that to happen so that rule nines can then drill down into the detail. Uh, and there are a number of inquiries where that's, that approach has been taken successfully. Thirdly, um, uh, on spotlights, 
um, we urge that a similar approach is taken with respect to other healthcare facilities and services. We've raised 111, 999, ambulance trusts, healthcare centres, GP surgeries and mental health facilities. Again, we're well uh, recognising of the imperatives of time, um, but in order to do justice to the terms of reference for Module 3, a concentration primarily on hospitals uh, is in our uh, submission not taking the issues far um, enough. And fourthly and finally, with respect to spotlights, preparedness. Um, from paragraph 12, we've highlighted a concern that the inquiry appears to be overlooking preparedness in this module. Um, the examination of preparedness in module one related to a high level only, uh, not to the healthcare or social care sectors. Uh, we've set out in writing um, to remind um, the inquiry what was said earlier by counsel to the inquiry in the earlier hearings, and in particular in the preliminary hearing for module one, where it was asserted that pre preparedness for healthcare and social care would be dealt with. <laughs> Um, within their own modules, and we'd um, um, urge a rethink on that. It's imperative in our submission that this is done. It's not sufficient that the position is restricted to staff shortages just prior to the pandemic, as asserted in the CTI note. In our submission, the inquiry should look at uh, the plans from each of the uh, 22 spotlight uh, hospitals and health boards for a pandemic uh, what their understanding was of the applicable national planning related in particular to IPC, um, infection prevention and control, isolation, testing, uh, visitation, resilience, staffing, bed capacity, surge capacity, tri triage systems, stockpiling, medical equipment, oxygen uh, and PPE. Moving on, evidence from bereaved witnesses. Um, we've heard what's been said th this morning. We're pleased that the inquiry has decided to call a proportionate number of individuals with direct knowledge or experience topics within Module 3. Uh, many of our families have such experience of systemic themes. Uh, we urge a calling of a proportionate number of them to that end. Uh, the voices of bereaved family members and others are powerful within hearings themselves. Uh, and hearing the living lived experience is of obvious importance um, to this inquiry, as in just about all others. Um, we provided a schedule. Again, uh, we would um, 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 be grateful for collaboration and cooperation with your team uh, about where that's taken. In selecting witnesses, um, we note that the inquiry is entirely properly um, uh, sought similar evidence from other CP groups. In the selection of the, the witnesses, we ask you to have uh, uh, consideration of the central position of the bereaved, the substantial number of families CBFFJ represents across the four nations. Uh, we urge you to consider diversity, uh, and we urge you con to consider how the evidence is relevant to the systemic issues of Module 3. Um, we've raised the issue of discrimination um, we've set this out in some detail in writing. Uh, we've addressed it regularly in e each module. Um, with respect, you have listened to us on those issues. Um, but disparities of out outcome for racialized minorities and issues relating to the treatment of disabled people, amongst others, um, are well known not just to the inquiry, but also there's a real importance to those issues within this module. Um, issues of institutional discrimination within the health services, plural, are very much live issues. Uh, um, we would absolutely encourage the inquiry um, to rely on the evidence so far called, but also to look carefully at it as to what other issues um, could be assisted by addendum reports from those experts or indeed possibly further reports from others. And those would include issues uh, as to the disproportionate number of deaths of BAME healthcare workers compared to the demographics of the workforce, um, issues as to whether uh, persons of particular minorities were disproportionately on the front line, and if so, why, uh, and issues of preparedness regarding protection um, um, uh, uh, with regard to particular characteristics or needs, uh, PPE, 
but it goes beyond that, of course. Um, in terms of disclosure, we're grateful for the update that's been provided. Um, we note that there was very late disclosure in both Modules 1 and Modules 2. On our analysis, by one month before the hearings, we had received 42% and 61% of the disclosure which ultimately came to us. That was one month before the hearings. Now, of course, that was due um, certainly in part to the pace of the inquiry and that it was working. Um, there has been a longer period for preparation of Module 3, um, and therefore we hope that the um, recognition of these issues by Ms Kerry this morning um, um, will lead to a, um, earlier, um, a disclosure of the bulk of, of the material. Uh, we're experienced enough to know that, of course, disclosure continues, um, uh, and so you can't put a stop date on it. Um, but if there is a concentration, a real concentration, on the date that we've suggested, and Ms Kerry has mentioned this morning, the end of June, then that will help all of us. Um, we are nervous about it, given the amount of disclosure that has been made to date and the fact that we are only five months away, um, but we do hear that we're being listened to on this subject. Um, experts. We've made submissions regarding um, consultation around experts and letters of instructions before. We don't resile from them, but we're not going to repeat them again. They're in our written submissions um, uh, again. We would note that where we have been involved in putting forward experts, um, then our perception is that that has assisted the inquiry and therefore we would hope going forward that that um, would be borne in mind by your teams. Uh, in our written submission, we've raised one further particular point that hasn't been noted this morning, uh, no reason it should have been. It's at paragraph 34 of our submissions, um, and we've asked you to consider instructing an expert to provide evidence of how to um, uh, healthcare systems um, of other countries fared. Um, we don't want to be misunderstood about this, we're not seeking wide-ranging evidence from across the globe. Uh, we're not seeking evidence to show where the UK should be positioned on some sort of um, international league table. That issue arose out of um, um, unevidenced assertions by the former Prime Minister, and we don't intend to go back to it. Uh, the purpose of commissioning such a report here would be look to lessons from elsewhere which might assist your analysis of what happened in the UK, but more importantly, may inform recommendations. Uh, and we've suggested two countries simply to keep the issue in proportion, in perspective. Uh, an expert report would not significantly uh, affect the timetable. Um, in our submission, um, countries should be selected in consultation with a suitable expert uh, and be of similar economic profile to the United Kingdom. Countries perhaps such as South Korea and Germany or perhaps Norway um, but that we, should, we say should be a, a matter for discussion between um, the inquiry and experts. Uh, in the absence of such evidence, you'll be assessing what happened uh, and what recommendations to make rather in the abstract. Um, the inquiry needs all the help it can get, and it appears to us that learning uh, from elsewhere might be particularly um, helpful. And finally, um, with respect to hearing dates, um, we've heard what Ms Carey has said. Uh, we simply note that there are two weeks of half term that covers most of the country. Um, if the uh, period of break of two weeks was pushed back by one week, it would cover both of those. We're not aware of what the problems with doing that are, um, but we um, would urge you to have a, a further look at that. Um, those are our submissions, unless there's anything else I can assist with. No, thank you very much indeed for your help, Mr. Worthy. Very grateful. Uh, I think, Mr. Feynman, are you going to go next before we take the break? Uh, my lady, I appear on behalf of the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families for justice. Um, 
you've received our written submissions, and I propose to use the short time that I have to bring to the fore some key topics on behalf of the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved. Um, as you are aware, uniquely in the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland has a fully integrated system of personal social services with healthcare, referred to as health and social care. The Health and Social Care Reform Act 2009 created a single regional health and social care board. This single health and social care board, working in conjunction with the Public Health Agency, commissioned services to meet assessed need and promote general health and well-being. These services were provided by six newly established health and social care trusts, Belfast, Northern, Southeastern, Southern, Western, and the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, HSC Trust, along with uh, other HSC arm's length bodies. Each health and social care trust was accountable for its performance and for ensuring that appropriate assurance mechanisms were in place. This obligation rested with the Health and Social Care Trust's Board of Directors. It was the responsibility of the Health and Social Care Trust Board to manage local performance and to manage emerging issues in the first instance. The, uh, and I'll call them HSCT boards for short, the HSCT boards remain responsible for performance management and assurance in respect of all of the HSCT's activities. There has been further modification in the Health and Social Care Act 2022, but the background prior to 22 is important as it lays the foundation for many matters which I seek to bring to your attention today, specifically in the context that many of our clients believe that each of the trusts or the trust areas functioned inadequately during the pandemic, none more so than in hospital settings and care homes. Our clients have genuine concerns about the Trust's guidance, standard of care, implementation of visitation, family liaison, end of life care, and DNR and DNA CPR protocols, and the stark lack of consistency on these issues across the Trusts. Much, if not all, of the inconsistency across the Trusts stems from the fragmented and complex health and social care structure operating for a relatively small population. This granulated structure has led to the existence of different policies and procedures, and thus differing standards of care and treatment across the trusts. Um, and I lay out that background, my lady, to give some context to the submissions that uh, I intend to make. Um, the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families for justice feel strongly that there should, if possible, be a forensic examination as to how each health and social care trust responded to the pandemic, with emphasis on the compelling differences in standards of care and approaches taken. To this end, as you will have noted from correspondence from PA Duffy solicitors on behalf of the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families for justice to the inquiry, we implore it to send Rule 9 requests for information to the chief executives of each of the five health trusts in Northern Ireland. In light of the division of the trust areas and on the eve of Module 2C, tranches of disclosure support the commonly held view amongst our group that there were different care and treatment standards employed across the HSC trusts due to different policies and procedures being employed. The, res the result, we say, was a postcode lottery. Examples from our client base include patients who were unable to re receive IV antibiotic treatment at home outside the Belfast Trust. This particular client's mother had to be admitted to hospital for this treatment and subsequently went on to contract COVID-19 in hospital. The family were told that if she was in the Belfast Trust, IV, antibiotic, IV antibiotics could have been administered at home, meaning that there was clearly an unnecessary exposure of the vulnerable or a vulnerable person to the virus. Another example of obvious divergence of approach concerns the expectations, rules, and protocol for testing of trust staff. Many of our clients have flagged this as a matter of particular concern, 
particularly in relation to domiciliary care. Our clients observe the screening of staff providing domiciliary care was not prioritised to the same extent as it was for staff in clinical care set or care settings. Many of our clients reasonably believe that domiciliary staff members brought COVID-19 into their vulnerable family members' home with little or no precautions taken to prevent the spread uh, of infection, including not wearing PPE and giving inadequate responses as to why they were not, they were not wearing the same. In our submission, the trust executives ought to be called to the inquiry to answer and to explain who was responsible for overseeing the drawing up and implementation of preventative standards for domiciliary care. It is only with first-hand accounts given by the heads of the relevant trust divisions that there can be a full and proper examination of the decision-making employed, the reasons for the same, and an assessment of the outcomes, both intended and unintended, if not obvious, of those decisions. What is not clear to our client base is whether there was any effective collaboration between trust executives. It appears on the face of it there was not. And if not, why not? We are keen to understand the level of communication between each of the five chief executives and their relationships what, their, their re, what were their reasons for employing certain decisions over others? Were experiences and lessons pooled and shared? Or did the trusts work in silo? The resultant effect, as referred to previously, was a postcode lottery. By way of example of some of the experiences of our group, they query why some trusts employed liaison officers to keep families updated and others did not. Communication, or the lack thereof, is a key theme for the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families for justice, whose friends and family were not properly and adequately appraised of the care and even death of their loved ones, and as a consequence, are left to suffer the purgatory of the unknown. Um, this has understandably added to the trauma of their loved ones passing. One of our group, Sarah Todd, lost her mother in August 21, her mother died in hospital. Ms. Todd was not informed that her mother's condition had deteriorated. Ms. Todd was not informed when her mother had even passed away. So I turn then, my lady, to deal with the issue of spotlighting hospitals. Whilst recognising the enormous pressures of time this module already faces, and that a considered decision has been made to choose the two largest hospitals in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families for justice are apprehensive that the focus on these hospitals will inevitably be at the exclusion of other hospitals, particularly given that the hospitals chosen are situated in the two largest cities in Northern Ireland, whereas 37% of the population in Northern Ireland live in rural areas such that there are other hospitals that serve those communities. The product of the current, current Spotlight Hospital's information may not be representative of the experience faced by our clients. Of the six health and social care trusts I've referred to, the current identified Spotlight Hospitals will only come under the umbrella of the Belfast and Western Trusts and do not examine the decision-making and, importantly, the impacts of those decisions of three other trusts. Because of the differences in decisions made by different trusts, a one-size-fits-all approach simply cannot apply. For example, the inquiry may well be interested in a serious in incident which de was declared in the Southern Health and Social Care Trust as a result of three clusters of the COVID-19 virus at Craig Avon and Daisy Hill Hospital between August and October 2020. In the three outbreaks, a total of 15 of the 32 patients with COVID died. These included specifically the haematology ward outbreak at Craig Avon, where seven of the 14 patients with the virus died. In the male medical ward outbreak at Daisy Hill, six of the 13 patients died. And in the 4S ward outbreak at Craig Avon, two of the five patients with COVID died. A serious adverse incident report was published in September 23 
and found that the lack of regular screening of inpatients or healthcare workers hampered early detection of hospital-acquired COVID infections. It also cited insufficient and inadequate isolation facilities, overcrowding and inadequate space for social distancing in the emergency department of Craig Avon Hospital. Naturally, questions arise as to how the outbreak compared to the decision-making and outworkings in other trust areas. If there were other systems in place that protected other hospitals, why were they not adopted in the Southern Health Trust? Were the systems that were adopted different to the other trusts? Can it be said that the differences led to this significant incident? It follows in our submission that without some flexibility, there is a danger that the unique healthcare structure in Northern Ireland may result in the inquiry being unable to sufficiently contrast the differing approaches made by health and social care trusts. For that reason, we ask that consideration is given to adding spotlight hospitals to the current list and potentially considering three or four hospitals in total across the five different health and social care trusts. And we've identified those of, in Antrim and Craig Avon as being the appropriate uh, hospitals. Um, finally, my lady, and on a more general note, uh, we seek some clarification regarding um, matters raised about the crossover of issues in earlier modules. At the preliminary hearing for module one on the 25th of April, 2023, Mr. Keith King's counsel clarified that preparedness in hospitals and care homes was not an issue which would be explored beyond general terms in respect of the UK government and the devolved administrations declaring how hospitals and care homes should prepare for civil emergencies and pandemics. Principally, a more detailed examination of preparedness in hospitals and care homes, especially at an operational level, must be for healthcare and care sector modules, and that is uh, a, a quote. Um, we welcome that clarification, but now on the cusp of module three, seek further explanation as to how the close interplay that module three, the impacts on healthcare systems in the four nations of the UK, and the outworkings of particular decisions made by respective healthcare systems, cross or span into issues that come under the rubric for module six the care sector. By way of example, in a letter dated the 3rd of April 2020, the health trusts wrote to the care home registered providers clarifying hosp the hospital discharge protocol regarding testing, making clear that there was no expectation that patients are tested for COVID-19 before discharge from hospital to a care home. Less than three weeks later, and by the 22nd of April 2020, there were 297 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in 60 care homes in Northern Ireland. In respect of the lived experiences of our client base, in the witness statement prepared by Marion Reynolds for Module 2C, she recounts how her aunt was discharged from hospital in poor health with effectively the same care package that had been in place before she was admitted to hospital, with no adaptation for the significant deterioration in her aunt's health, or that the family support that had previously been there was absent because they too were suffering from COVID. When the Health Trust were challenged about this, the family were offered an anecdote about another person who was discharged on the same care package. This was cold comfort to the family who knew this arrangements, the, the arrangements were demonstrably inadequate and put Miss Reynolds aunt at serious risk. Whilst failings of this nature may have been present prior to the pandemic, the impact of reduced oversight of mechanisms during the pandemic compounded the problem and elevated the risk. And so my lady, it's for those reasons that we ask the inquiry to consider our request uh, in respect of the health and social care trusts and the spotlighting hospitals. Unless, my lady, there are any matters which I can assist with, those are the submissions. Thank you very much, Mr Byman. Uh, we shall break now. I shall return at 10 past 12 uh, to hear from Mr Henry.
Mr Henry, I think it is next, isn't it? Yes, good morning, my lady. I appear on behalf of Scottish Covid Bereaved, as instructed by the inquiries team at Amar Anwar and Company. Your ladyship has received our written submissions, and I adopt those submissions. I propose to use my time this morning to make brief further submissions in relation to disclosure, expert reports, other witnesses, and timetabling. Turning first to the issue of disclosure, the Scottish Bereaved note all that has been said by Council to the Inquiry in relation to that this morning. It is hoped that your Ladyship's notices under Section 21 of the 2005 Act allow for the matters, allow for all the matters in the relevant Rule 9 requests to be addressed and for evidence to be provided to the inquiry timelessly. Your Ladyship has submissions from a number of core participants in relation to the issue of disclosure. I don't intend to rehearse those submissions, save to repeat our submission that, standing the volume of disclosure, it is hoped that all possible steps are taken to allow for the disclosure process to be finalised in good time to allow for all matters to be considered in advance of the substantive hearings. Moving on, my lady, to expert reports. Your Ladyship has the Scottish Bereaved's comments in relation to the report concerning Long Covid, and we will provide our comments on other reports in due course. Scottish Covid Bereaved note that in relation to primary care and emergency pre-hospital care, Professors Snooks and Edwards have been instructed to provide a report in that regard. We note what has been said this morning by Council to the Inquiry about these reports covering all four nations of the UK, but given the different healthcare system in Scotland, it may be that we have additional submissions about the need for a discrete report in relation to Scotland. But we await the disclosure of that report, my lady, and we will make any submissions required in due course. We note the submissions of the UK and Northern Irish bereaved about the need for reports to cover issues of structural and institutional discrimination. That is an approach that the Scottish COVID bereaved would welcome, although we do note all that has been said by Council to the Inquiry this morning. Turning then, my lady, to other witnesses, the Scottish bereaved consider that the inquiry requires to hear the evidence of the former Scottish Chief Medical Officer, Dr Catherine Calderwood, during the substantive hearings. We are, of course, aware of the issues surrounding securing Dr Calderwood's evidence, which arose in Module 2A, and it is hoped that steps can be taken to allow for Dr Calderwood to give evidence, even if that is out with the hearings currently set. Finally, my lady, moving to the issue of timetabling, the Scottish COVID bereaved understand that a great many issues will require to be addressed during the substantive hearings. We have concerns about whether this can be done in the assigned hearings, and we would welcome a further preliminary hearing to address the issue of the witness list and timetabling. We do, however, welcome Council to the Inquiry's confirmation this morning that the two-week break in the hearings will not be pushed back. Well, I understand that other core participants have submissions in this matter, my lady. Were the two-week break to be pushed back, it would no longer coincide with the October week school holiday in Scotland and would have uh, issues for those in Scotland who have childcare responsibilities. So, my lady, those are my submissions, unless there are anything, any matters which your ladyship requires to be addressed. No, thank you very much for your help, Mr Henry. Very grateful. Right. Miss <clears throat> um, Faradney, you're hiding back there. <laughs> trying to make myself seen and heard. Um, good morning, uh, my good lady. Morning. I'm Aswini Weera Ratna. I appear on behalf of Khamri COVID bereaved families for justice. You have our written submissions on which we rely this morning, and I'd like to address four points in, in addition. Firstly, on section 21 <coughs> notices, we note that a section 21 notice has been served on the Welsh Government Health and Social Services Group um, Non-compliance and lateness have been ongoing issues 
throughout uh, this inquiry uh, and on previous modules as well with the Welsh Government in submissions for the last preliminary hearing in September 2023 on this module, the Welsh Government stated its commitment to cooperate fully with the inquiry and that two detailed responses to Rule 9 requests had already been provided. Our clients are disappointed, therefore, and angered to hear that in spite of reassurances given, the uh, Welsh Government's poor compliance has necessitated a Section 21 notice from, um, from, from my lady. Secondly, then, I'd like to turn to spotlight evidence and spotlight hospitals, and this is a very important issue uh, and of some concern to our clients. Uh, we've had lengthy correspondence on this issue with the inquiry legal team since early February. Our clients are grateful for the time that the, client, the inquiry has given them on this issue, and also grateful for uh, Ms. Carey's submissions this morning and in her note. They address some, though not all, of our concerns. Our clients have expressed their extreme unhappiness with the selection of two hospitals in Wales for this task, and our concerns and our clients' unhappiness will uh, be repeated and amplified today. Regrettably, there's been no shift in the inquiry's position, as we've heard, and our clients feel heard but not listened to. We uh, consider, we'll consider carefully what we've heard today, but our clients do remain somewhat uncertain as to how this proposal is intended to actually work. From our understanding of this task, there are still a number of shortcomings in the proposal which lead us to question its value. The operation of and responses in Welsh hospitals are, of course, a key focus for Cymru uh, bereaved families, and our clients are anxious that their concerns are properly aired and interrogated in this inquiry. And this anxiety and underlines our submissions on this point today. Also, I want to echo uh, that in Module 1, Mr Keith King's Council created an, ex an expectation that the detail of preparedness on healthcare would be featured in this module. And it's very important to our clients that this is done with regard to Wales. My lady may recall that a significant proportion of the membership of this group lost their loved ones as a result of hospital-acquired COVID-19 or in the care homes following discharge of hospital patients without testing. The first point uh, I'd like to make is on location. And it arises from the fact that uh, in her note, uh, Ms. Carey notes that the spotlight evidence is intended to cover both rural and urban areas. But in fact, only hospitals from two areas of South Wales have been selected, and that's been commented on by others as well. Large swathes of Wales, the rest of South Wales, for example, North Wales, and rural areas are not covered by the selection made. While it may be reasonable not to actively seek information from the areas worst affected, in our submission it makes little sense where evidence points to a particular problem in a particular area to ignore that during this exercise or not to seek to build on it. For example, the National Nosocomial COVID-19 Programme Report was provided by the Welsh Government earlier this year for a period ending the 31st of January 2024. This showed that the highest rate of nosocomial infection was in North Wales within Betsy Cadwallader Health Board, <coughs> and that the rates of nosocomial infection varied greatly across Wales. Hence, our reference to the postcode lottery in uh, Wales um, and Wales' particular geographical and demographic characteristics in our written submissions. Failure to consider this variance uh, in our submission not only limits the voice of those bereaved in other areas of Wales, but also leaves a gap in understanding of the UK-wide issues, which we now understand is what this evidence is directed at. There are a number of relevant issues raised by our members, which we have already brought to the inquiry's attention uh, and these arise across the health boards. And uh, examples are also at Annex A of our written submissions, which have been provided for context. We raised uh, concerns with the inquiry legal team in correspondence about the rates of nosocomial infection, healthcare facilities, and access to healthcare facilities in North Wales. As an example, based on the experiences of our clients, of an area where useful evidence may be sought, 
one of the stated aims of the spotlight process is to identify key themes and particular issues. We would question again whether two hospitals from South Wales can adequately identify the key themes and issues of the whole country, in which different regions had different demands placed on them. So the point we make is that each health board faced unique challenges and responded differently to common challenges so that key themes in Wales need broader scrutiny. Understanding the range of issues within Wales is surely critical and crucial to add to the inquiry's understanding of UK-wide issues. Looking at the rationale and criteria applied as set out in uh, Council's note, at paragraph 9 it stated that the purpose, quotes, was to obtain evidence of the impact of national decision-making and leadership upon those operating within healthcare systems, including how hospitals responded on the ground to the pandemic. We agree it's a laudable and proper aim, and we focus in particular on the words on the ground, because we struggle to see how these aims are in fact satisfied by evidence from a chief medical officer, a point that's already been made, but if I may, uh, we, we also say that this will be inevitably too, at too high a level to be useful and in our submission will be unlikely to convey a true and vivid sense of what it was like to battle with the pandemic on a daily basis in the wards of the chosen hospitals, whether in Wales or elsewhere. And from the topic list in paragraph 13 of Council's note, at little a, for example, on staff shortages. Is it not relevant also to hear from staff on the ground how staff shortages impacted on their work within those hospitals? Would that not provide a more rounded picture of any problems? This will again, we submit, bring to life, and this is important, for the public, the inquiry, and CPs, what it was actually like for frontline staff at the chosen hospital. A crucial level of understanding in our submission for the crafting of meaningful recommendations. At paragraph 9, Council's note states that spotlight evidence is not the only way by which Module 3 will examine the impact of the pandemic on those working and being treated in hospitals. Whilst that was not elaborated on in the note, we did hear this morning that impact evidence requested from CPs and the accounts in the Every Story Matters process uh, will, will be used in this regard. The questions in our, in our submission that still arise uh, are how will it fit with and make sense of the spotlight evidence? Will uh, core participants be given an opportunity to respond to that evidence? If the intention is to use expert evidence to fill any gaps, for example, on analysing the rates of nosocomial infection across the UK, then we would make the following observations. Experts are not able to cover the actual experiences of staff on the ground. And uh, Council has alerted us to a problem with the infection prevention and control expert evidence at paragraph 31 of her note, though, of course, we do note her submissions on that this morning. So our, our concerns about gaps in evidence more generally about the Welsh experience are underlined by the expert draft intensive care evidence, which has recently been circulated uh, and the responses are formally due on the 16th of April. Uh, for now, we can say our view is that the draft report does not adequately deal with devolved issues, and we'll be responding with details on this by the deadline set. That is a lacuna which raises for our clients the concern that the Welsh experience is not being sufficiently addressed in this module. Further, is on gaps in the evidence. We heard that other evidence on nosocomial infection rates, for example, is available from the Chief Medical Officer of Wales, Public Health Wales, and Welsh Government Health and Social Services Group. Again, and I'm sorry I'm being repetitive on this, our point is that this is high-level evidence and unlikely to throw light on the impact on the ground of decisions and leadership for healthcare workers interpreting guidelines from on high. On some issues, as noted in the draft intensive care report, guidance dif differed from area to area, leaving clinicians to decide how best to respond. Lastly, uh, we say that there's no indication as to whether 
or how evidence gathered by the spotlight process is to be tested? Is its reliability to be taken as read? Or will CPs be given an opportunity to interrogate it? And if so, on what basis? If it's not tested, we would question its value to the inquiry, or even how useful or proportionate an exercise this actually is. This may be a particular concern to devolved nations. It's de definitely a concern to the understanding of issues in Wales. I do offer my apologies for sounding so disgruntled and negative about this process, but this is what our clients feel. It's a very important strand of the inquiry, and without fully explained reassurances as to how else the key issues and themes will be elicited, the mantra that the experience in Wales will be thoroughly examined begins to sound somewhat hollow. We do acknowledge the burdens on the inquiry, and we do raise concerns as to how this is a proportionate use of the inquiry's resources in relation to Wales. So we do ask once more that this is reviewed, and that if statements from each of the seven health boards cannot be taken, that at least that one or two of the other health boards are considered from other parts of Wales and are included in this exercise. And also that consideration is given to including staff and clinicians uh, from the chosen hospitals. Uh, my third point was on delay in listing. Um, our experience in other modules is that disclosure has been late uh, and sometimes comes after the event. It's not unusual. In module one, crucial evidence of risk registers was disclosed on the 12th and 13th of July last year when the Welsh witnesses had already given evidence and we had no longer the opportunity to put these documents to those witnesses. Uh, similar issues were encountered in module, module 2B. We understand that delays are unavoidable, but repeatedly CPs are having to play catch up. It in inevitably impacts on effective participation, and in particular where lay participants are concerned, who need to, more time to absorb what is disclosed, even with legal advice. With respect, we say it's not sufficient to say it's a knock-on effect of the late production of disclosure by other state bodies. It doesn't really help our clients. We are concerned that the balance between timing, resources, CP participation is, could be struck better, and that more time for hearings and also for Rural 10 questions is necessary. We are anxious that there should be no delays in the timetabling, but added to the woes already referred to is the listing of hearings virtually back to back. In general, written submissions are due one to two weeks before a hearing and three to four weeks after the conclusion of a hearing. So the overlap and demands in the work is clear, and especially where there is, say, six weeks between hearings. This is onerous and potentially impacts on the fairness for CPs and their ability to respond adequately. Uh, the, I was going to make a fourth point on expert reports, but I've already made that, um, the points I wanted to make on that. So just on Rule 9 requests, uh, we've heard what counsel to the inquiry has said, and we've raised uh, in our written submissions at paragraph 4 uh, the requests that have already made, uh, which, uh, which we have repeated in, in our written submissions. So uh, with the greatest respect and repeating the understanding that time and resources are not a bottomless pit, Cymru families feel that they must record their disappointment and frustrations uh, at this point. But we do look forward to continuing to work and collaborate with the inquiry in the work of this module. My lady, thank you very much. And uh, unless there's anything further I can assist you with, those are no. my submissions. Thank you. Mr. Straw. Is your microphone on? Um, I hope it is. Is it picking oh, up? Better now. Yep. Thank you. Um, my lady, I'd like to address eight topics this morning. Um, first, the need for people to be central to this investigation. The very first line of the NHS Constitution for England is the NHS belongs to the people. The reason why the Constitution repeatedly makes clear that the patient will be at the heart of everything the NHS does um, is that this is the most effective way of organising a health system. In the same way, uh, we submit that the most effective way that this module can examine the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the health system is to place people at its heart. 
uh, it is only by focusing on the lived experiences of individual patients or staff that this inquiry will fully understand and learn from the pandemic uh, and from its response. In consequence, we warmly welcome the indications from the inquiry in this module uh, that it will focus on individuals. Uh, however, we are concerned with the approach that um, appears to be taken to spotlight hospitals in this respect, and, and I'll come back to that in a moment, if I may. Uh, the second topic is the issues to be investigated. We made some submissions about the inquiry's provisional list of issues previously um, for the purpose of the last preliminary hearing. There's been no specific response to those submissions, um, and the time scale for a revised list of issues um, is now said to be the end of May. Um, we, we would invite the inquiry, if possible, to produce the revised list of issues sooner than the end of May, if, um, if it can do, because this would provide assurance to core participants that their submissions are being addressed, um, and it's also very important to guide future preparation. Um, in light of recent developments, the CPs, um, RCPs have further submissions about what issues should be investigated. <laughs> so, firstly, healthcare outside hospital. The hospital setting, while of course is very important, should not be given disproportionate attention in this module. It's important to also investigate the impact of COVID and the response to it on healthcare outside hospitals and to consider healthcare holistically uh, across the range of relevant contexts. Healthcare is provided in hospitals, but also in GP surgeries, by community care, at home, in residential care, uh, in hospices, and in a number of other settings. As the NHS Constitution for England states, um, at five, the NHS works across organisational boundaries. The NHS is an integrated system of organisations and services bound together uh, by the principles and values reflected in the Constitution. The NHS is committed to working jointly with other local authority services, other public sector organisations, and a wide range of private and voluntary sector organisations uh, to provide and deliver improvements in health and wellbeing. And we submit that th that approach, again, should be reflected in the inquiry. An investigation which encompasses healthcare outside the hospital it, it is important for two key reasons. Um, firstly, non-hospital healthcare involves critical services uh, which are provided to a very large number of people. For example, the NHS provides some 95 million contacts in community services each year. Restricted access to community services for many meant that non-COVID related health needs were left unidentified and untreated and, and this led to serious illnesses and deaths. The second reason is that healthcare outside hospital raises specific and different issues with respect to COVID and the, and the response. To take some broad and basic examples, the risk of COVID infection were different outside hospital. Effective infection and prevention and control measures were different, and the dangers of not providing non-COVID healthcare and treatment were also different. Uh, we note that a number of other CPs have made similar submissions to this for the purpose of this hearing, uh, including the British Medical Association at paragraph 28 uh, and CATA paragraphs 3.1 to 3.2, which we endorse. The next additional issue is regulation and oversight. Issue two in this module's provisional list of issues is core decision making and leadership. Um, we urge the inquiry to include within this uh, the way in which systems for complaints, regulation and oversight of healthcare um, operated during the pandemic. Those systems were suspended or otherwise hugely disrupted it's difficult to see that that was, that was appropriate since regulation and oversight were no less important during a pandemic and this ought to be examined. The third additional issue is end of life health care or other care. Palliative care for patients with COVID-19 in acute hospitals is, is issue 5B within the uh, list of issues for this module. It's unclear whether other forms of end of life or palliative care are covered. These are important topics that were overlooked during the pandemic, and which ought, we say, to be covered at some stage by this inquiry. Um, there are a number of issues of public concern in this area, which include um, the following four. First, a lack of end-of-life care for non-COVID conditions, uh, a lack of end-of-life care for any condition outside of acute hospitals. This left many people to die alone and without support. And um, the second issue of concern, the reasons for the lack of end-of-life care, these may include entrenched systemic inadequacies, 
uh, and that older and disabled people were considered to be expendable. Third issue, restrictions on visits from carers and loved ones. And fourthly, whether those delivering palliative care outside hospitals were provided with sufficient PPE and other support. So we invite the inquiry to make clear that it will in investigate these issues at some point, and we also invite it to consider calling expert evidence on end-of-life care. Um, this may be obtained from the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London, and in particular from Professor Irene Higginson, and we'll forward a copy of her CV to the inquiry so it may be considered. Fourth and final addition in issue is um, that we agree with Mr. Weatherby King's Council in urging you to include preparedness for health and social care within this module. The next topic is spotlight hospitals. Um, while this is a potentially useful aspect of this investigation, um, we submit that it should not be exclusive and should not preclude a full and proper investigation of the relevant systemic issues by other means. CTI's note for this hearing at paragraph 9 appears to recognise this and that this won't be exclusive. But to give an example, um, topic H in paragraph 13 of CTI's note is visiting restrictions. One of the concerns of the CPs who I represent is that visiting guidelines were interpreted and applied very differently between different hospitals and other healthcare settings. In some places, they were applied very restrictively, and this led to serious harm. Um, some examples of this are set out in our witness statement, paragraphs 37 to 39. Now, while this might be examined to a degree by the Spotlight Hospital process, it's unlikely to be fully understood by that route, and so we submit other evidence is necessary in order to, to fully investigate it. Now, this morning, um, Ms Carey King's counsel appeared to suggest that uh, evidence will not be taken from patients or their families in respect of the Spotlight Hospitals only staff. Now, if I've interpreted that correctly, um, then we would object to that approach. Um, for the reasons I gave at the start, we submit that it's very important that evidence is taken from patients. Without that lived experience, the perspective from Spotlight Hospitals will be one-sided and will overlook key issues. The next topic is mental health. As to the investigation of adult mental health by this inquiry, the November 2023 update note stated that while this won't be examined in, in this module, module three, it will be investigated uh, in another module or other modules. Uh, it's not clear which module will examine this important issue um, or why it doesn't fit most obviously within this module. And that's why I'm raising this again, uh, again now. Um, we respectfully submit that it is, it is important that adult mental health is investigated. The, the pandemic response, restrictions on visits, for example, had a, a very severe impact on those with psychiatric uh, problems in hospitals or otherwise. Mind submissions for this hearing uh, give some examples of this at paragraph 19, and our witness statement gives other examples. Mental health healthcare is an integral part of the broader healthcare system. And we agree with MIND that, as a consequence, it should fall within this module. In any event, uh, we respectfully invite the inquiry to confirm in which module this will be investigated. The next topic is further evidence. Uh, we make six suggestions for further evidence, whether this comes from experts or from other witnesses who are able to help. This is set out in detail in our written submission, so I'll just briefly summarise and add a few additional points, if I may. So, firstly, uh, the use of do not resuscitate or do not attempt CPR notices. This is issue 6B within the provisional list of issues for this module. There is evidence that these notices were issued on a very wide scale on an inappropriate basis, that is, without consulting the person and or their representative. And it's arguable that there were broad systemic issues behind this, for example, age, disability, or other discrimination, uh, or at least that there were inadequate local or national guidelines. The examination of this issue, we say, would benefit from a witness, again, not necessarily an expert witness, but someone who can digest and summarize the complex evidence as to how these notices were used inappropriately across a broad range of settings, and can help identify whether there were systemic flaws behind that misuse. 
The second uh, new area of evidence is access to healthcare outside NHS premises. Um, CTI's note uh, indicates that Professors Snooks and Edwards will examine a number of aspects of healthcare outside hospitals, and, and we welcome that. Um, Ms. Carey, King's Council has partly dealt with this earlier today concerning mental health, but um, we invite this inquiry uh, to make clear that it's instructed the professors to include healthcare provision in as full a range of settings as possible outside hospital. So including community settings, uh, in people's homes, care settings and so on. As touched upon above, there were specific and diff different issues of concerns applicable to healthcare outside NHS premises. The third area of evidence, the clinically extremely vulnerable population. Um, this population is covered by issue 11 on the inquiry's list of issues. Uh, we invite the inquiry to obtain evidence, potentially expert evidence, about certain sub-issues within this point. Namely, I, whether the conditions which were considered to be extremely vulnerable were appropriately categorised as such. Um, II, whether the uh, restrictions on access to healthcare and other matters which resulted from this categorisation were proportionate, and uh, three, whether alternative but less onerous means of protecting these individuals from COVID should have been adopted. The fourth area of additional ex uh, evidence is access to an impact on healthcare services for those with learning disabilities and cognitive impairments. Again, Ms. Kerry has touched upon this this morning. The pandemic response had a particular and severe aspect, impact on people with learning disabilities and cognitive impairments, for example, with dementia, uh, not least in accessing uh, healthcare. People with learning disabilities were around eight times more likely to die during the pandemic. This isn't a peripheral healthcare issue, uh, it is central. There are a number of specific and discrete issues of concern which, co which govern this group, which we respectfully submit ought to be investigated in this, in this module. They include uh, lack of access to familiar caregivers and widespread failure to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that this, um, this group of people could access healthcare. We therefore in invite the inquiry to, to consider um, it, investigating this issue and um, with that in mind, we suggest an expert who would be able to help do so, uh, Dr. Emma Wolverson clinical psychologist and reader in ageing and dementia at the University of Hull. And again, we'll, we'll forward a copy of her CV to the inquiry. The fifth area of evidence, carers in healthcare. Um, we submit that this module ought to examine the critical and inseparable role of carers, including family carers in healthcare. Given the specific and often overlooked role that they play, this module may benefit from expert evidence about unpaid carers in the NHS. And then the sixth area of additional evidence is nosocomial transmission in hospitals. This falls within issue eight in the inquiry's list of issues, and we invite the inquiry to consider whether expert evidence would assist in respect of this issue, um, particularly in, in relation to certain uh, specific topics that are set out in our written submissions. Um, the final two areas uh, of uh, uh, the, the final two topics I'd like to cover um, are, are firstly cross-module issues, so issues which cut across two different modules or more. <laughs> NHS have invited the inquiry to clarify how issues which cut across more than one module will be examined and where the dividing lines are. Uh, an example is the DA, DNA CPR issue. Now, if the inquiry will do as NHS England asks, we invite it to bear in mind that a number of, in a number of ways, health and social care are inseparable. Um, and this means that for some cross-cutting issues, it's not properly to investigate the issue in isolation in each setting. Do not attempt CPR as an example. It appears that the bodies, systems, and other factors that are responsible for the widespread use of, misuse of these forms are, are inseparable. And it's therefore necessary in order to properly understand this issue to consider it across the whole range of health and co social care settings. Some other issues, however, might be investigated separately in more than one module. Um, end of life care is an example. Uh, it appears that this inquiry intends to investigate it in both module three and module six, and we, we endorse that approach, um, given that those who are responsible for it and for the issues are, are broadly separable. However, we would invite the inquiry to maintain a degree of flexibility in light of the evidence which is obtained. Um, the last brief point, um, if I may, is that um, in, it, it concerns expert questions and instructions. 
Um, in, in module six, this inquiry has decided that it will provide to court participants the questions it gives to experts. There are obvious good reasons for doing so, which we've set out in the past. We respectfully invite this module to reconsider its position and to take the same approach as will module six. My lady, unless there's anything else, those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Straub. Very grateful. Uh, Mr. Cave. My lady, yes, thank you very much. Um, I act with Adam Wagner and Rosa Palaszczuk on behalf of two core participants. The first is clinically vulnerable families, and the second is 13 pregnancy, birthing, and parent organisations. We are instructed by Slater and Gordon, solicitors on behalf of both, and I have Shane Smith in attendance with me today. My lady, on behalf of the 13 pregnancy, birthing and parent organisations, I have no substantive submissions to make at this hearing, save to say, thank you very much. Uh, we're very grateful for the updates from Ms. Carey, King's Counsel, this morning. In particular, the inquiry's aim for disclosure to be complete by the end of June or early July, bearing in mind the school holidays. Uh, and also to say that the pregnancy, birthing and parent organisations are working hard to identify suitable individuals to provide impact evidence to the inquiry, and they were very grateful to be asked to do so. My lady, on behalf of clinically vulnerable families, who I will refer to as CVF, there are five topics I wish to address today. The first, my lady, is the inclusion of uh, the clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable as a separate equality group. My lady, this is a submission which was made by Mr. Wagner at the last preliminary hearing, but it's an issue that CVF feel particularly strongly about, and no ruling was made on it, so they have asked me to repeat the submission today. My lady, the pandemic, as you'll be aware, had and continues to have a distinct impact on clinically vulnerable people. They remain at higher risk of severe disease from COVID-19, and they've had to make difficult choices about the extent to which they can participate in all facets of public life since public health measures have been withdrawn. CVF's core concern, my lady, is that the distinct impact on the clinically vulnerable was insufficiently considered throughout the pandemic. And at present, they feel that the clinically vulnerable as a group have practically been forgotten within the healthcare system, but also in wider society. CVF are therefore keen to ensure that this very serious oversight is not repeated in the inquiry. And so in that context, CVF's overarching submission is that the inquiry must consider clinically vulnerable people with an appreciation of their distinct interests in this module and that it must specifically bear clinically vulnerable people in mind when investigating the healthcare response to COVID-19. Now, your ladyship will recall that the inquiry's terms of reference include an obligation to consider any disparities evident in the impact of the pandemic on different categories of people. And, and the terms of reference make clear that those categories include, but are not limited to, those relating to protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So evidently, uh, the scope of the categories of people is within the inquiry's discretion. Uh, my lady, the inquiry's equalities and human rights statement on the website currently states that when investigating unequal impact among different groups, the characteristics which will be considered are groups with protected characteristics, geographical differences, social economic background, occupation and immigration status. And while those are all hugely important groups, CVF were disappointed to see that the clinically vulnerable are not identified as a relevant group or characteristic within that statement, notwithstanding the statements made on their, the submissions made on their behalf at the last hearing. So CVF therefore repeat their submission that the equalities and human rights statement should be amended to add clinical vulnerability to COVID-19 to the list of characteristics 
which will be considered by the inquiry when investigating unequal impact among different groups or populations. And whilst this may appear to be a, a fairly small step by the inquiry, uh, CVF submit that amending that statement would be a, a tangible demonstration of the clinically vulnerable's important place within this inquiry and will ensure that the mistake of overlooking this group is not repeated in the inquiry as it too often was during the main phases of the pandemic. My lady, my second topic is reasonable adjustments at the sub substantive hearing in the autumn. CVF are exceptionally grateful to the inquiry's operations team for the steps taken to enable their in-person participation at preliminary hearings to date. Your ladyship may be aware that CVF has been engaged in correspondence with the operations team in respect of appropriate reasonable adjustments, which will allow CVF members to attend and fully participate in the substantive hearings. CVF does acknowledge that online attendance at those hearings is possible. However, they are very keen for CVF members to have safe access to the physical space, if at all possible, and they remain concerned that this will not be possible as matters stand. CVF will continue to liaise with the operations team in respect of this, and they sincerely hope that a creative solution will be identified to enable their full participation in the substantive hearing. My lady, my third topic, expert evidence. From CVF's perspective, the inquiry must ensure that it has the evidence necessary to properly consider the impact of the pandemic on clinically vulnerable people as a key demographic. With that in mind, they have two brief points to raise. The first is a point of clarification on the current expert evidence. CVF are very grateful for the inquiry's confirmation that some of the experts already instructed will address the challenges faced by the clinically vulnerable. In particular, Professor Snooks and Professor Edwards' report on primary care and emergency pre-hospital care will address issues around the shielding program. They were very pleased to learn that. But in addition to the points which were summarized today, um, which will be addressed by Professor Snooks and Professor Edwards. Uh, the inquiry is invited, if it has not already done so, to instruct those experts to specifically consider the long-term effects of shielding on all shielding people, but at, in particular, my lady, the psychosocial effects of shielding. CVF's very strong view, which is supported by its members' lived experience, is that the psychosocial impact of shielding is just as important as any other long-term effect. And that must be addressed in that evidence for the inquiry to have a full understanding of the shielding program. My second point on expert evidence is simply to endorse the submissions made by, some of the submissions made by the Johns Campaign CB, uh, core participant group uh, and specifically on the instruction of a specific expert in respect of the clinically extremely vulnerable population, albeit if that request is granted, CVF would want to feed into the contents of the instructions. And CVF also endorse John's campaign submissions in respect of obtaining an expert in respect of hospital acquired transmission of COVID-19, especially airborne hospital acquired transmission. So CVF asked that the inquiry seriously considers those requests. My fourth and penultimate topic, my lady, is the importance of module three addressing the impact of COVID-19 on children's experiences of healthcare. Uh, the CVF have already noted that there is no explicit reference to children in the provisional scope of module three. And they are of course aware that there is a separate module upcoming on education and children. However, that does not, in CVF submission, distract from the need to consider children's particular and distinctive experiences of healthcare as part of module three. Uh, we note what was said by Ms. Carey, King's Council, this morning in, in respect of Professor Edwards and Professor Snook's report specifically 
Uh, but notwithstanding that, CVF submit that the impact of COVID-19 on children's experiences of healthcare, including clinically vulnerable children, and the impact of shielding or not shielding on clinically vulnerable children fall within the scope of module three and would be grateful for confirmation of that from the inquiry. If the inquiry does not propose to consider those issues within the purview of module three, then CVF seek confirmation of whether they'll be considered in the forthcoming separate module on children. My lady, finally, um, some brief observations on the submissions made by other core participants in respect of spotlight hospitals. Uh, CVF hear what was said in respect of that this morning. They do echo the concerns about a rose-tinted corporate view, uh, but they will review the statements with interest when they are disclosed. Uh, and briefly, CVF endorse a, a specific submission made by COVID Bereaved UK a paragraph 13 of their written submissions, which is that the concern that a focus on a very limited number of spotlight hospitals may be at the expense of consideration of wider systemic issues that were faced by the population. For example, differences between NHS trusts in respect of their approach to DNA CPR and the COVID-19 decision support tool, which is of particular concern to CVF. My lady, unless I can assist further, at three, three minutes to one, those are my submissions on behalf of CBF. Excellent timing, Ms. McKay. Thank you very much indeed for your submissions. Um, break now? Right, we shall break now, and I shall return at uh, two o'clock.